like only halfway set up for everything. <laughs> there aren't there aren't millions of tarantulas or scorpions or anything, so don't don't be too worried. How would the tra the scorpion get into her bed? Have you ever seen a lizard inside a house? Yes, it's the same way, just like similar. Skin. And when you if you if you stop and think about like how the houses are down there, they're much more porous. Mm -hmm. They're uh, there's not not such good seals, you know. You don't have you don't have air conditioning to keep keep insulated from and all that. So there's there's a lot of opportunities. I mean, yeah. I think there's a few in the world that might be able to kill you if you don't get medical treatment. But like a, a lot of times, it would be like getting stung by a wasp. It's like if you have an allergic reaction, that could be bad. But otherwise, it's like, ouch. But yeah, we we probably have them here, just not yeah. super common. So, so they're fluorescent. So if you if you shine like a black light on them, yeah. <laughs> In fact, um, so fun fact about myself. So I. I often play um, disc golf as kind of my hobby sport sort of thing. In the winter, it gets dark. So we play glow golf. So you, you get some glow in the dark tape and put it on your disc and then you can like go find it. And so you, then you have a black light and you're searching around so you'll find centipedes that have like two fluorescent stripes. And you're just like, you're looking for your disc and then there's like this bright shining, what is that? Oh, a centipede, cool. They look pretty neat. I haven't, haven't seen a scorpion yet, but it's usually winter time, so it's kind of not as common. All right, so hopefully we won't have any uh, stingy type stories coming back uh, after next week, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, hopefully some some adventure is just not the uh, the super dangerous bad kind, right? There's a certain levels. It's like if it if it could have been bad, it's like kind of maybe it adds to the excitement because it was safe and fine. You know, no, nobody nobody got hurt. Um, but okay, so um, the. I, I think they probably have a nurse on staff. Um, the healthcare is socialized, so it's actually free for anybody, but it's also not the best quality. Um, so there will be definitely medical care available, and they always bring a good um, first aid kit anytime we go to the field. So that they they have they have those systems in place, um, and hopefully we won't need anything that would warrant like really importantly high quality <laughs> medical care. Um, Okay. <laughs> What's that? I said don't get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's uh, wrap up just what we were talking about last time to get to kind of end of these slides. Uh, dealing with wastewater, we're talking about latrines, kind of the, the purpose. We actually had a nice intro to it today, kind of in application. This is what it looks like, and this is where it becomes a problem. All, it, all told, what we're trying to do with wastewater treatment in general tends to try to meet certain um, criteria. If we're going to discharge to a body of water, we want to get rid of BOD, the oxygen, oxygen demand, or oxygen demanding substances. So that's one of the big ones, and that's to do with we don't want the dissolved oxygen to go to plummet in a natural system, kill all the fish, kill all the everything, and create a stinking mess, right? That, that's a pretty obvious one. Then we also don't want to flood it with solids. Right? Even if they were clean solids, we still wouldn't want lots of solid particles that could disrupt fish and wildlife. You know, it, it's pretty disruptive if, let's say, you have some aquatic vegetation and suddenly it's covered with particles. This could be a construction project, right? You could have suspended solids from a uh, construction project that covers everything. Um, we wouldn't want that because it could kill fish and wildlife likewise and just make the whole thing, you know, it's a, a problem. pH, if you had some weird thing, and then we get to, of course, to our fecal coliforms for the specific concern of pathogens, right? Obviously. 
Um, another one's oil and grease, which we don't think about too often. Probably not super important for most like decentralized systems, um, but it's one of the conventional ones. It might mess with your bacteria if you have a ton of oil and grease, and perhaps if you have a little restaurant or something, um, and you're trying to deal with a sustainable sanitation solution for a small restaurant, maybe it could become a problem. Otherwise, we, we tend not to have too big of a, an issue with it um, in general. So let me, there we go. Um, the reason in a more industrial scale, we don't want um, oil and grease discharge is because rivers can catch on fire if you don't regulate that. <laughs> That's quite bad um, and quite crazy to, to think about, read about. This is, if, if you wanted to see it in action, here was a, I think about 10 years ago, an oil pipeline burst in the Moscow River or something. So it was leaking a bunch of oil, it caught fire, and then you have a river on fire. And how do you d extinguish that? Um, if you know about grease fires, you know water is not the right solution because it sprays the, the grease everywhere. Because the grease is floating, it's uh, less dense, it's also flaming and on fire. So if you pour water on something that's less dense, it will move away and try to go away. And you're probably also gonna boil some water pretty quickly. And so you just get a spray of hot flaming oil grease everywhere. So I don't, I guess the firefighting attempts here are perhaps just trying to keep that boat from somehow keep that boat from um, completely burning up. But yeah, what do you do? <laughs> are you going to spray water from on the grease fire? Are you going to spray oily water on a grease fire? <laughs> what's the, what's the uh, solution here? Probably kind of have to let it burn out in some way. Okay, so in when we stop and think about, well, what do we need to treat at minimum, then we can start thinking about, well, what are we going to treat uh, you know, how are we going to do it? What's a, what's a latrine going to look like? Or what kind of um, system are we going to use? Um, open defecation is the last resort, right? You have biological needs, you have to defecate, you're going to defecate, right? And if you have absolutely no infrastructure for that, it's probably going to be open in the sense of you don't have any privacy or you have very little privacy and there's nowhere for it to go that is dedicated for it to go, right? Um, you know, in a very small scale, let's say if you wanted to go backpacking or something, you might bring a shovel, you can at least uh, bury it and deal with it that way and carry on. And perhaps that's sustainable in the scale of a backpacking trip. So, you know, occasionally people take a backpacking trip through some area. It's not heavily populated. It's not the same spot every time and so on. And there's animals defecating openly all the time, right? So it's, in some sense, that might, you know, we could relate to that in the sense of that could work, but not in the sense of that's where you're living, right? That's not, that, and a lot of people living there. So the next sort of thing is you, big a, you dig a big pit and put some sort of a toilet on it. Not, probably not an actual toilet, but some, you know, you have a latrine system. Um, so that would be for what we would call black water, anything that's directly coming, um, you know, defecation basically, and any contact with that. Uh, gray water would be bathing, washing, and cooking. Um, you could perhaps uh, separate urine from black water. You wouldn't normally, but if, if you want to get fancy, some technologies that you might be able to more easily create fertilizer from urine. Um, so if you're getting high tech, for a low-tech problem kind of thing, uh, you might try doing that, and then you could have a separate stream. There's some advantages there. I think we might talk about in you know next month or you know in a few weeks, um, like kind of on the technological aspect, designing a system to extract the nutrients you want to avoid pathogens. Um, separating like that might might actually be pretty helpful. But in general, it's that black water that uh, and the defecation the fecal matter that we really have to to take care of. So as we design some sort of a solution, we want to think about, well, how much are we going to produce? How much sludge, solids, all of that is typically produced. Now, in the US, we have estimates ranging from 40 to 90 liters per capita per year 
um, that might not be the US, that might be just in general. It, there's a good chance that's like septic, um, septic tank systems. Um, so if we're generating that much solids that need to be removed, um, there's a few things that go into that. Your nutritional habits, how much nutrition you have can, can affect that. Uh, sanitation practices, um, you know, what are you wiping with? What are, and are you disposing of that in, in a, um, you know, in a pit latrine, for example, is probably what you would do. Um, a lot of things like that can affect it. Is the gray water added to this? Is it not? There's a bunch of factors that can dictate this solids production. And it's not actually just like, you know, when we say solids, the fuller picture is that bacteria are going to be munching on stuff. You're going to have a lot of bacteria. It's kind of what's happening in our guts right now. Bacteria growing in certain spots to decompose things and producing bacterial cells along the way. Um, and so in a, a pit latrine, for example, or a septic tank, you're actually going to have what we would call digestion. So converting some of the solid stuff into um, dissolved or liquid matter. Uh, so some of that can escape on a mass balance. You would have some of your, let's say, carbon. This might be a simple way to capture it all. Some of the carbon would be leaching into the ground if, if you have a porous system. Um, <clears throat> so it's not a direct, like, you know, it, it's not so direct as what goes in is what goes out. So there's a lot that goes into that. Okay, in terms of nutrients... The nutrients that you end up with, uh, the typical adult is going to produce 25 to 50 kilograms of feces per year, and that would contain uh, about 0.55 kilograms of nitrogen, 0.18 kilograms of phosphorus. Uh, whereas, so that's fecal matter. Where if we look at urine, we're producing typically about 400 liters of urine, um, and that would contain something like four kilograms of nitrogen and 0.4 kilograms of phosphorus. So if you if you take a quick look. Um, we actually we excrete a lot of ammonia uh, or ure urea that can convert to ammonia and all that. A lot of nitrogen compounds in our urine compared to in our feces. Um, certainly it's not insignificant here, but as I mentioned, if you're looking towards some sort of fancy sustainable design, if you can have that separation, you can convert this pretty well into a fertilizer. In terms of designing something, it would probably also be good to be aware of, well, how much, you know, what do we expect to be the nutrients that we need to remove if we're going to discharge, let's say if we have a surface discharge, we might calibrate accordingly to what kind of, how, what level of nutrients do we need to remove? Okay, but typically, we're just going to have a pit. So we don't necessarily calculate that. We'll probably have some estimate of solids accumulation. So we dig a pit a certain, a certain depth and that's going to be sort of our design. Now, with latrines, there's a few things that we ought to consider. Um, some some reasons why we would not, you know, we I forgot wh where the threshold was for the when is it a um, improved sanitation source, right? I think a a pit latrine was just over the mark, right? Uh, I think we talked about it. At least you have some enclosure, and maybe this door works and closes. Um, hopefully, <laughs> I, I've not visited this one, but a few things to think, uh, you know, keep in mind is perception is a big deal. Um, are people going to even want to use this? There are issues of odor and flies, um, perhaps other insects. We're talking about scorpions and things, right? Um, actually I have, well, I'll give you a, a quick story. So. When, uh, when I was in college, I had an internship with NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So I spent a, a summer in Seattle, and one of the weeks I was there, they sent me to Eastern Oregon to do some field work. It's so like out in the middle of nowhere, I was doing like salmon habitat assessment stuff, and we were catching little baby salmon and tagging them and counting them and stuff. So that was pretty neat, but it was in the middle of nowhere, and there's this little, um, there's one guy that was kind of staying there the summer. He had a camper. I just brought a tent. There's no running water, no electricity, and the sanitation options were uh, in the field and a shovel, or these two latrines that um, 
you know, it was just used so infrequently that they were not, you know, <laughs> they didn't look too different from this thing, <laughs> a little better shape, um, but there were a bunch of like wasps and things. <laughs> and, um, I decided to brave it and I will, <laughs> thankfully I had no, no issues, but uh, yeah, it, every time I needed to use it, it was, it was quite nerve wracking because yeah, there was, there's a lot of insects around. <laughs> so that was a, that was an interesting moment. Um, okay. So, so along that note, you know, if I had been stung, I think I would have changed my, <laughs> changed my decisions. It was, it was in the middle of summer, so it was hot. So all the insects were pretty sluggish, thankfully, and not, not, uh, angry at me. Um, but privacy, you know, in this case, if that door doesn't work, that's a concern or if there's a gap in the paneling. I told you that other story about, you know, the, the roofless one that didn't have walls that were very high. Um, you know, if you had somebody over to your house or apartment or something, if your bathroom's disgusting, you might have some embarrassment, right? There's social aspects here that like, oh, do I have something presentable for people to use, right? Like there's, there's actually a lot that goes into thinking about um, stuff like this. Uh, of course, odor and flies relate directly to a spread of disease. If the flies are in the feces and then on your food, that could very well be a problem, right? Um, so there's, there's a lot that goes into what's up with the latrine, a lot to be desired for your typical pet latrine with no special improvements. Um, so a lot to think about there. And another aspect even is, well, are you, pre are you is your slab that kind of covers it and has a hole in it, is that sturdy? Because if that ever breaks, that could be, I mean, that could be lethal to, to somebody if they fell into the, a deep pit and couldn't get out or something, you know, that, that could be very, very bad. Okay, so the, I mean, this is back to, to where we were there. The simple pit latrines technically, uh, technically are considered improved, but not ideal there. So what is a simple pit latrine? Technically speaking, um, we can see a diagram here. I mentioned a moment ago, we'll have some sort of slab. Hopefully this is something sturdy. Uh, if you built this out of wood, then you better be careful and better be ready to maintain, replace the boards as needed, right? So hopefully it's a concrete slab and is done well. Uh, especially if you are placing this directly above the pit. This is actually quite common, right? A simple pit latrine like that. Um, hopefully you also have some sort of walls and structure here, uh, but at its most basic, you're gonna have a slab with a hole in it, uh, perhaps some places to put your feet, um, to squat, and that'll be that. Maybe a lid to cover it when it's not in use. Uh, that's maybe ideal. What it's gonna do for you is confine your waste. There's issues of groundwater, right? There's probably gonna be, uh, you can kind of expect there to be leaching of, of water across this. If you have a high water table, you would, might expect water to be coming in as well. So it's probably not gonna be um, impermeable. So uh, the pros we could say, well, we've confined the waste and that gives us some basic separation between human and waste. But the cons for this type of setup, we've got odor, flies, that risk of collapse. Generally, there's, um, you know, it's not the most sanitary arrangement. It would be very easy to, to get contamination, especially if kids are using this, around where people are going to be standing, maybe barefoot, and so there's a pretty big risk of hookworms with this type of thing. Pathogens breeding in the, uh, the pit. There's probably gonna be a lot of biological activity. The temperature will probably be a bit elevated. Some of our human pathogens might actually be able to propagate instead of just like be outcompeted by other bacteria. So lots of reasons to consider that's uh, not so ideal. This might be a, an example. We've got a little cover, uh, foot pads, and the hole would be there. Uh, so what can we do about it? Well, we might at least check on the status of the little tree, right? How much lifetime it, does it have left in terms of how much, uh, how much more solids can the pit uh, contain before you have to dig a new pit? Ultimately, you'll, you'll fill it in, cover it, seal it, 
and just sort of be done with it and dig a new pit. Like that's typically what's going to happen over a long time scale. All the waste in there will eventually be indistinguishable from soil, right? But we'll take a long time. Um, I'm sure a lot of plants will be happy to grow on all those nutrients and all that. So sometimes what you would do is you dig multiple pits and then move the latrine as needed. Um, sometimes if we do something a little more advanced, we might dig two pits, have a latrine separate a little bit and have the discharge going to one. And then when it fills, swap the discharge, right? That, that might require a bit of a poor flush type, type of system. Okay, so back to you know the status, we talked about the slab, how much more space is remaining, how proximal are we to water supplies, right? We talked, you know, Caroline and Brian talked about that earlier. That's certainly a potential issue as well. So if we advance on it, if we have, if we have the ability, we might take an actual toilet and you don't have to have plumbing for it if you have some access to water and you can just dump a bucket of water. Right, so if, if you ever, let's say, ran out of water pressure at, at your home, but you had, I don't know, aquarium or a pond outside or something, you could take a bucket and flush your water with just like that, right? That would be, that'd be no problem. Um, so that might help and that could channel the, the waste to a certain place and give you the opportunity to not be having a slab directly over a nasty pit. <laughs> You know, so we could avoid that situation with poor flush. Uh, ventilated improved pit latrine VIP. Ventilation can be quite handy. I think I've got more slides on that. We'll discuss a little more in a minute or next time. Basically, a way to keep the flies out, a way to keep the odor down a bit. Um, it's a pretty simple way to do that, but you have to actually intend to do that. You can design it that way. And finally, a couple other options. You could make a composting to toilet, an arbor loo, meaning like you use a tree to kind of stabilize the old pit. You know, every time you dig a new pit, you plant a tree on top of it. It's probably going to be a pretty happy tree, um, but I don't know if the fruit would be good. <laughs> not not sure if the can, the pathogens could trans you know transport, but uh, might might be worth checking. Um, and then uh, there's a link to the Amigos modern bathroom system here. That you know, in some sense, that's an ideal if you're able to put all the pieces together and have a functioning uh, treatment that, that can handle more continuous flow, more flow of water. Okay, so I think I'll just give you a quick little look at a VIP latrine here. So we would have a fly screen that would prevent flies from getting in. We would design it so that we'd get some airflow, probably something like this, so that essentially that what we want is for air to not flow from the latrine itself into I was from the pit itself into the latrine. Um, you see this one is offset. So it, it's not, we don't have any piping, but at least most of the slab is not over the pit itself. You could be fancy and separate for urine into this area and just let it drain into the soil separately or collect it. You've got this ventilation system that should be drawing air out. Um, that would also help keep flies from, you know, from always migrating this way if they do get in instead of going back out that way um, and a few other um, accessories there all right so that's all we have time for um, have a great spring break I, I hope that those of you that join have a great one yeah I do not have them yet so for those of you traveling I'm hoping they're gonna be at my at my apartment tonight and I'll bring them to, to the office tomorrow um, but I'll let I'll let you know Worst case scenario, we'll, I'll be handing them out at the airport and I'll be like, well, at some point before we get to Managua, throw this off. <laughs>